Psalms chapter 139, verses 1 through 8 from the New American Standard Bible read, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I get up. You understand my thought from afar away. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before there was a word on my tongue, behold, Lord, you know it all. You have encircled me behind and in front and placed your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot comprehend it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, the grave, or hell, behold, you are there. How do you talk to God? How do you hear from Him? Do you speak to Him in more formal or informal conversations, as some did in the Bible? Do you copy Jesus' formal example in the Lord's Prayer, Our Father, who art in heaven? Do you follow Abraham's comfortable examples? God called him the friend of God. Do you mimic King David's intimate examples? God said he was a man after his own heart. What do you talk to God about? Do you converse about certain subjects while avoiding others? Because I was raised in church as a boy, I started talking to God early in life. But I did not talk to him about certain subjects because they were uncomfortable. As I began to read the Bible, I read in Psalms chapter 139 that says, He knows your every thought. I realized it was useless to withhold some of my thoughts from him in my prayers because regardless of whether I spoke the prayer aloud or in my mind, he knew everything I was thinking. Some of the uncomfortable subjects I didn't want to talk to him about were things like sex, people who made me angry, selfish desires or motives about what I wanted to buy or get. When a person goes into psychotherapy, the therapist will purposely ask you questions you are not comfortable answering. A good therapist will discuss subjects that you do not want to discuss. In the past, I used to be a registered therapist. I learned that regardless of if a person comes to you for help, They may not be fully honest about their motives or completely open to receiving your help. But even if you do not have formal credentials to be a therapist, you still operate in that role with your family, your friends, and your coworkers when they come to you with questions and asking for advice. How do you ask God for His advice or help? Do you first try to do something and only after you've made little or no progress, then ask for His help? Do you whisper to God under your breath right before you engage in a difficult situation with a difficult person? What about the reverse of those questions? Do you think God ever wants our help before he engages in a situation or with people? Do you think he'd like your help or participation in something before he does it? Do you think sometimes he may speak to you formally or a small whisper that you could miss? All those questions have been demonstrated in the lives of people in the Bible. Why would God sometimes figuratively whisper to us and risk missing what he wants us to know? I hear many people say this phrase, God is always speaking to us, but they usually don't elaborate on what that means. Can you imagine if God was continuously talking or communicating to you? How much would you miss what he's saying because your focus has to be divided between what you're doing and trying to listen to him? Remember how sometimes when you're listening to someone talk, you might start to lose focus and your mind wanders on other things? Some of you may be doing that right now. You hear what I'm saying, but your mind has started to wander to what you need to do later or what you'd like to eat later. When you speak to some people, whether they're children or adults, You learn how to condense your points and be concise with your words, else people will lose interest or forget something important you're hoping they'll remember. God understands us better than any person will ever understand or know us, because as Psalms 139 says, He knows our thoughts even before we finish thinking through our thoughts. 
Sometimes when you've started to ask God a question, before you can finish asking it, you might receive an answer back. Look again at the end of verse 2. It says, You understand my thought from far away. God is not physically far away from us because He's everywhere. This verse is saying when we are in the process of gathering or completing our thoughts, regardless they are far from us, God already knows what we are thinking before the thought has arrived completed in a sentence for us to speak or say in our minds to Him. As verse 4 says, Even before there was a word on my tongue, behold, Lord, you know it all. If God knows what our answer will be to a question he may ask of us, why then even bother asking? Why ask us to do something if he already knows whether we'll say yes or no? Some people say because God is all-knowing, he knows everything that will or will not happen. If that's true, then he doesn't need to ask us for anything, even our help. Some people would be offended by that statement, saying, God doesn't need anyone's help. I'll come back to address that statement, but first I want us to remember the story Jesus told in Matthew chapter 21, verses 28 through 32. But what do you think? A man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go to work today in the vineyard. But he replied, I do not want to. Yet afterward he regretted it and went. And the man came to his second son and said the same thing. And he replied, I will, sir. And yet he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that the tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you. Jesus was telling this parable to the religious leaders of his day. They thought they would be going to heaven because they were not like the sinful tax collectors and prostitutes. But Jesus said in the last verse, those sinners were going to heaven because they believed the message of repentance and baptism that John the Baptist preached. The religious leaders were so arrogant, they did not realize they were hellbound because they rejected the message. When Jesus spoke about the two sons in this parable, he was giving an example of how God gives us messages, even instructions to be saved. And regardless that he knows our thoughts of whether we say yes or no, he still asks, hoping that we will say yes and actually respond with our actions. Regardless that we can say no, he still asks, hoping that we will change our minds like the son in the parable did. Every day, God is speaking or communicating to people throughout the world. Not only does he know our thoughts, but he knows the thoughts of the 9 billion people all at once. When you're in a room full of people talking, you might be listening to more than one conversation at a time, especially if you're hearing some really juicy gossip. But what's your limit? Can God have a limit? Does scripture say he knows some of our thoughts or all of our thoughts, even from afar? Some months ago, I preached a message about Calvinism versus Arminianism. For the last few centuries, seminaries and churches have based their teachings on one of these views or some combination. Basically, Calvinism says God predetermines everything, including those who are going to heaven or hell before they were even born. If that's true, then our free will to reject or accept Jesus doesn't exist. And praying for your loved ones or witnessing to them is pointless because God already predetermined who would accept or reject him. Not only is that depressing, that's contrary to all of the Bible's instructions to pray and witness to the lost. Arminianism is supposed to be the opposite of the Calvinism view, that people have the free will to reject or accept Jesus. Many people will choose that view but still claim God has some sort of predestined or foreknowing view of what will happen in people's lives. If God knows everything, whether we'll obey his requests or commands, then why would he let some people be born knowing they'll reject him throughout their life and suffer an eternity in hell? The answer to that is in Jesus' parable of the two sons. We are like those two sons. He knows our yeses and our noes. 
He knows we may change our mind and hopes we would choose as he would. That makes some people uncomfortable because there is a comfortable laziness in saying God is in control of everything because he knows our thoughts, what our decisions will be, and everything that will happen. It can be terrifying and exhausting to understand that the responsibility of God's preferred will occurring will be our choice. And remembering the alternative is his consequential will of destruction, death, and the loss of salvation for many people, including our loved ones. Earlier, I'd return to a point, or I said I'd like to return to a point that some people think God doesn't need our help. But the Bible is filled with examples of him wanting and asking humans for help. One early example is Abraham's intervention with Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis chapter 18, verse 17 says, The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Regardless of the sin that those cities sank to, he was still hoping he didn't have to stop the evil through destroying those cities. God chose to talk to Abraham about his consequential plans because they were friends. This example of God wanting our help repeats throughout the Old Testament. He's looking for people to have conversations with him, knowing to know what he is planning and intercede when needed. Ezekiel chapter 22 verse 30 reads, I searched for a man among them who would build up a wall and stand in the gap before me for the land so that I would not destroy it but I found no one. The first time I really started praying and interceding for people was near the age of 19. I was in the Navy and started learning about this subject. I'd read books about how God wants to, wants our participation to get others saved. I started fasting and praying for the first time in my life and started having people respond and had some demonic encounters. In one event, I was sleeping and sort of fell out of my body. I was still asleep, but I could see in the room and everything around me. In front of me was this creature that looked like some sort of giant raisin. I had a feeling this was a demon. I asked it, what are you doing here? It said, you brought me here. I realized that because of the amount of time I was putting in prayer and witnessing to everyone in my social environment, it was enough that the demonic noticed and was fighting my efforts. Where does this concern come from about the lost? How do we start having a burden, not just for our loved ones, but even strangers that are hellbound? Consider how King David conversed with God. His conversations were intimate. When you read the Psalms and Proverbs, he doesn't just talk with God. He expresses his fear and anger. How often do we hold back our anger or fear in our conversations with him? Do we ask him how to deal with the pain and injustice that we experience? Over the last several years, I've experienced betrayal and rejection through personal and professional relationships. I've asked him how I can handle these situations and consequences that make me so angry and hurt. And no matter how many times I forgive these people and turn my attention elsewhere, the painful cycle comes back. I don't think that I'm that good at hearing God's voice as some people are. But I do have ideas that come to my mind in response to some of the questions I ask God. One example is how I've poured my love into some people. I've given them my time, energy, resources, and money. And in return, I'm taken for granted, disrespected, and attacked. One friend told me she has been so hurt by her adult children, she has stopped talking to them and wishes that she never bore them. No matter how many times you may forgive some people and pray for them, the painful memories of what happened can still return. The answer I feel I received from God came in the idea that He's trying to talk or communicate to people throughout the day. He pours out provision, protection, and love in many different methods, but they keep ignoring Him. I hope I never experience a type of pain that that mother spoke about, of the broken relationships with her children, her adult children. But I realized God continuously experiences this every day, throughout the day, simultaneously among 9 billion people. 
And that's not even counting the billions who have lived throughout the centuries who have betrayed and rejected him. Those who once walked with him and those who never chose to. He sees every baby grow into adulthood. He suffers their continual rejection, knowing their thoughts that they think they're a good person that will never go to hell. Then watch them forever perish into hell. I couldn't bear to watch the lifetime of just one person in that way. I suspect that's why God sent the flood during Noah's time. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of mankind was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. Before King David wrote Psalms 139 that explains how God knows all thoughts everywhere at all times, Moses wrote in Genesis that God knew every thought. Jesus warned that right before he comes back for us, the thoughts of most people will be as commonly evil as it was in Noah's time. Matthew chapter 24, verse 37, For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. My time is almost over in this sermon, so let's return to the opening questions I asked. How do you talk to God? How do you hear Him? In the friendship style of Abraham? Intimately, like King David? Formally, like the Lord's Prayer? What do you talk to God about? Do you converse about certain subjects while avoiding others? Do you know how to recognize when God is wanting to communicate with you about something? Do you think He'll just tell you? Or that there is some information you not only have to ask Him, but you have to spend some time in prayer and deep conversation to discern. Proverbs chapter 25, verse 2 reads, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. This verse says, He chooses to withhold some information, and some is only gained through the deep conversations with Him. How do you think Moses and David were able to write scriptures about God that He knows everyone's thoughts? If Lucifer knew this, he would have realized it was futile to rebel against God. Regardless that he saw God continuously, he did not know him intimately like Moses and David did. One last question. What do you think God is waiting to tell you? The answers to some problems and prayers that he wants you to know may only be revealed to you depending on how you choose to converse with him.